we have enemies we believe that you need to have enemies in order to exist and as a good brand that's how we work with clients we think that if you stand up for your opinion and beliefs which we think is the only way true way you will get enemies hello i'm freddy ust and you're listening to gut talks double g u double t freddy ust is the founder and brand director of snask a creative agency based in Stockholm. and was launched with zero experience almost two decades ago. Freddy has been featured in several interviews and podcasts where he talks about his approach to branding and design, but not only. At Snask, they make enemies and gain fans because every brand is not for everyone. We talk about his experience not fitting in, stories and anecdotes along the journey, therapy, loving and being loved, AI and branding. So make sure you check their website and materials. Here we go. This podcast is brought to you by GUT, fostering a culture of innovation to build better products, ventures, and cultures. I'm Maria, and I enjoy adding value and helping wherever I can, widening my spectrum of thoughts, even if it can sometimes challenge the mainstream. This is why we give data a voice and co-create a collective intelligence involving both people who are not always in the limelight and those who are, in order to learn from each other and spread knowledge and critical thinking. All I ask is to rate the show, leave a review, and share it. It's a fantastic way to help other podcast explorers discover our content. I'd love to know more about you and your preferences to continue producing this kind of content. So type in go.gut.com slash talks. It takes 60 seconds to complete. That's go.ggutt.com slash talks. Now let's get started. Thank you so much for being on Gut Talks. Thank you for having me. Um, and you asked me offline just before we started the recording, how did I hear about Snask? And I had the best answer ever is like, I can't remember. <laughs> but, but what I remember is that Snask was memorable. So that's what I remember. And I, I think, I, I mean, it was on LinkedIn somewhere that I heard about Snask, but I can't remember how, where, whatever. But I just remember what Snask as the name <laughs> and your website. And some of your swag, actually, your merch, like make enemies, the pink, all your badminton pictures, <laughs> like all of that. And I'm like, okay, that's quite refreshing for a branding agency. And that is, you feel the fun that transcends, you feel that it's stuff you want to look at. So I'm just curious because I know that you started your agency straight after graduation with like zero years of work experience. Mm-hmm. What is it that made you do this? Yeah, first, thanks for all the nice words. I mean, I'm super thankful for those. The thing when starting out with a zero experience, we did our internships in London and New York, and we quickly found out that we didn't want to be a cog in a big machinery. So we didn't want to work at a big agency. Uh, so our choice was either to work in a small agency or start our own agency. and. We also asked some people in the industry what they thought. And they said, well, you need at least 10 years of experience in order to start your own agency. And we felt, but whose experience is we going to get? Probably old white man's experience. And we felt, well, why not just start our own agency, make all the mistakes ourselves and try and find our way of doing things. And 17 years later, that's still the, the way we go about things. We make mistakes and we try and figure out what our best way is. And change is our best thing. Like we, we always change all the time with time because we have to. So if you were to do it again, you would do the same thing. Yeah, definitely. For sure. I mean, the way we, we are set up today, now we feel much stronger. In the beginning, we had imposter syndrome and we felt like, oh my God, someone is going to call our bluff and realize we don't, we're not so sure of anything. And now, I mean, when we've been around for so long, we do have our way of doing things and actually not being sure about anything. It's actually a strength because the time is going so fast outside the offices, new medias, new ways of doing things. So I think that the people who are stuck in ways of do, how to do things, they are the ones now feeling more insecure, I think. So for the listeners who are not sure about what Snask is and what's special about it, can you just share what is Snask? I'm not sure if we're special, we're pretty normal. But Snask is a design, branding and film agency from Stockholm, Sweden. We have 
enemies. We believe that you need to have enemies in order to exist and as a good brand. That's how we work with clients. We think that if you stand up for your opinion and beliefs, which we think is the only way, true way, you will get enemies, but you will also get fans. And you can't have the whole world as a client anyway. And it's just how humans work. So I think that maybe that's something that we stand a lot for uh, as NASC. And maybe that's, that's something that, I mean, that's why we have the conservative world as our biggest enemy. And that's also why change is our strongest, why we fight for change all the time. Was that um, make enemies and uh, fans? Uh, that was kind of your mantra, right? On your uh, website also, manifesto and make enemies is one of your jumpers. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's part of our manifesto, but it's also the name of our book. It's called Make Enemies and Gain Fans. And yeah, it's basically our view that in order to be a strong brand, you need to have values and opinions, even if you're a company or a person. And you can't please everyone and it's not for everybody, obviously. So it's a bold statement to make. Did you start with this in mind? Yeah, there might be other people, of course, who said similar things. Everything is a remix these days, but we didn't brainstorm it from someone else. We sat down and we were like, okay, but we believe that making enemies is actually a good thing. And that doesn't mean you should go out and just provoke people, but it actually means the, the statement behind it is to have opinions and beliefs and stand up for them. Voicing your opinion publicly, we think we would believe in that. So when you got started, were you, because obviously when you start, it's not easy, right? You need to find customers, you need to know how to deal with them, all of this. So you have this business knowledge that you learned along the way, right? In your case, may, this is part of the mistakes, I guess you were mentioning. Yeah. Um, were there brands you said no to at the beginning also? No, in the beginning, I think there wasn't any brands that contacted us that we felt that we couldn't work with. But as time goes, it's easier to have more values about who you work with when you're small. And it's much harder, we, we believe, when as time goes, and you start working with a bigger range of clients and you're working with a bank suddenly and you work with different kinds of it. And then you have to see, okay, well, we said, for example, we said no to Philip Morris, the tobacco company, but it's nothing that we're particularly proud of. If we just felt in that instance, no, we don't want to do this, but at the same time we do alcohol. So if you break that down, tobacco only hurts the person who smokes it. While as alcohol shatters families, there's domestic abuse, children's abuse, abuse of everything. And it, it's probably a way worse drug if you compare it to, for example, tobacco. So you can be very sitting on a high horse and tell the world that, oh, we don't work with tobacco, but if you work with alcohol, it makes it harder. Or yeah, you work with this bank and this bank is owned by this big uh, investment bank and it becomes very complicated after a while. I think the easiest thing for us is to not work with politics that we don't agree with. That is, of course, very easy. But after that, it gets trickier. It's easier to work with a small independent shoe brand than, for example, Nike. But at the same time, as Naomi Klein found out, the smaller shoe manufacturers are often worse and the bigger ones because the bigger ones have the eyes on them and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's hard. It's tough, especially when you frame it like that also, because some of those big, actually most of the big corporation, if not uh, corporations, if not all of them are owned by two or three companies. Mm. I mean, it's not a, a secret or anything. It's online everywhere. It's like BlackRock, Vanguard and some other, and they own like all those brands that we all know. Like, I, I can't start naming because it's pretty much everything if you go to the supermarket, right? So do you have to turn a blind eye sometimes so you can continue to work? Because what you said is quite interesting from like alcohol and tobacco. Yeah, I mean, it is hard. It is it's hard, but I guess you just have to day by day make a decision. And sometimes, of course, especially now we're on our way into a, a crisis, a financial crisis, then you have to decide, uh, is this client worth it? And will this client, if we say no, and we don't exist in a year, is that going to be fine with us as well? Because you have to go to yourself every time and, and search yourself and feel if it's okay or not. And I think that is the moral question. I mean, everyone have 
different morals and it's very hard to say that you are wrong or I'm right unless it's mm-hmm. extreme of course so it's also hard to do what do you say pinpointing how others should do it I think it's very much up to you inside yourself and how is it with your team and co-founders are you always aligned or sometimes you have to do kind of a ping pong <laughs> discussion to see okay I mean like this or not Me and my partner are most often aligned almost every time. I think, well, actually, I don't think we ever not not been aligned, but the team that we set together, it's sometimes we, they, someone doesn't want to work with a client and that's totally fine because we put together teams for each project. And if someone doesn't want to work with a certain type of client, et cetera, it's totally fine with us. And also we don't believe that person would do a great work if the engagement isn't there. So that's totally fine with us. I like where this is going, actually, what we discussed. Because it it can also be seen as, okay, you're a company that does branding, strategy, films. And it can also be seen as, okay, that's the choice you made to build brands and help other companies. And also sometimes you're not aligned with the company or the product or the seer the products they sell but you like the people who work there also and i guess this is where you'd be like i would really like to work with this team or this person but i'm not sure about the brand right Ooh. so do you have a funny story on that we work a lot with spotify since we love music and my partner eric is a musician and always been and i know we know a lot of musicians and spotify of course doesn't pay artists enough It's, it's a bit problematic for us to believe in that product and the, that their business model. But of course, we like the people working there. But drawing that to a funny story is that when Spotify contacted us to work, they were pretty hesitant and then they were very shy. And then they asked us like, oh, but do you really want to work with us? Blah, blah, blah. And we were like, yeah, of course, why not? And then we spoke to them and they're like, well, for three years ago, we sent you a request if you wanted to rebrand the whole Spotify and you never even replied. And we were like, what? And then we found out that our third co-founder, Magnus, that he had just thrown it in the, in the junk mail because of Spotify. He thought it was spam from Spotify. Oh. So he didn't even open the email. So it's a funny story. We ended up working with them in the end. And the way, not rebranding them, but working on other branding projects. But yeah, it's kind of a funny story. But it's a double-edged sword. I mean, working with a client where, of course, we like some things that they do and we like the people working there, but I have to say, do we believe in their business model? No, we don't think that that not paying the actual source of where, where of the product enough. I, I, no, I, I, we don't think that's a sustainable business model. Well, trying to play, I wouldn't even say devil advocate, but looking at things differently. There's like, when you talk about business models, These are things in constant evolution and they introduced Spotify for podcasters and things like that. I don't know. So maybe <laughs> things will change more towards what you lean towards. But uh, I like that story, actually. So <laughs> when you were uh, contacted by Spotify, I guess you were not big enough. So you didn't expect to have. Th- this is going back to making assumptions, right? Uh, yeah, that, that for would sure. Be... I have a few questions here just going back to how you you started actually if you travel back in time in what led you to do what you're doing today so if you draw from experiences from your childhood i know you were originally from south korea mm-hmm. uh, you're adopted and you moved to sweden right yeah maybe you want to give also an overview on that but was there anything in your past and upbringing that led you to be like I'm all in, I'm going to take risks, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to make my bold statements and build brands. Like, t- did that shape you and who you are today? Yeah, definitely. But maybe not design or branding per se, but definitely the entrepreneurial side of me or the rebel inside me is definitely from being adopted from another country to the north of Sweden, not looking like anybody else being shorter than anybody else, not fitting into the norm or the stereotypes of where I grew up. Of course, that made me fight harder, I think, for things. I'm also one year younger than all the people in my generation because in South Korea, they counted, uh, they changed this last oh, year, yes. but they counted uh, us as one year when we were born. Yeah. So I also grew up with people who were one year older or some of them two years older because they were born 
uh, much earlier in the year. And so I think that made me having to work harder without understanding. For me, I think it was just normal. I think that people who make it, because not everyone make it if it's harder, but the people, for example, with dyslexia who actually make it, they go very far, like the CEO of Goldman Sachs or whatever. Because they were seen to their, the presumption was that they were going to fail anyway. But when they didn't, they basically could do whatever they wanted because they almost broke free of those expectations. And I think maybe similar, not the same for me, because I don't have this this dyslexia, but somehow maybe me growing up thinking that, oh, this is normal for everyone was fight harder all the time. But for me that it then became a normal thing. And when I realized that anything is possible. It's only up to me to make it possible, at least for me in my instance, that's the way I felt when I grew up. I think that influenced a lot on how I see the world and also the rebel inside me still. What is it that made you realize that it's up to you and you can achieve anything? Not not looking at everybody else, not fitting in and, and actually having to try harder, I think, and work harder, maybe to be on par with everyone else, maybe. I mean, that's my assumption, but I'm not sure, but also fighting against authority. Uh, I think I've always had a problem with authority in the army. I had definitely a problem with authority because I did the the military service in in Sweden. Because when I grew up, it was almost mandatory and I had a problem with authority ever since. So for me, maybe that comes from that as well. And I'm way too old today to still be a rebel, but I still am. So I never go out of it, maybe. So how was the army experience for you? How, how were you dealing with authority? And I guess you were the only one again who didn't fit in, right? Yeah, almost. Yeah. But I mean, I, I actually didn't deal with authority. I, I almost, I think every time I felt that something was wrong or it made, it irritated me, I basically voiced my opinion and told them. And in the army, you're not supposed to tell, to tell them what you think. Uh, you yeah. should just follow orders. But it only if somehow made me grow in the ranks in their hierarchy system. So I just got more and more responsibility, the more I kind of questioned things. And I don't know, it was kind of interesting, actually. I mean, I would never do it again. I would never do the army again, but it actually, but I don't regret it. I mean, it, it helped me. I learned more to read different kind of people because you, you are placed with 30 other 18 year old boys in a room and you're going to live there for 10 months and no one is the same and everyone is from different parts of the country with having different views. So in a way you learn a lot and also you grow up as a boy because you have to clean yourself. You have to leave your clothes in the washing part. You have to make your bed perfect every morning. Even if it sounds kind of like banal, it's actually, it makes you also grow up a little bit. So I, I think it was still like a good experience in that way. And and I guess this reading people part also specifically helps for your work. Yeah, for sure. I then studied uh, media communication, psychology, rhetorics and stuff at university, which I think in a way, all of them comes to branding and, and strategy and stuff like that. So question after studying in the UK, right? And feeling a bit different in Sweden. You went back to Sweden and mm-hmm. you're still in Sweden. So, yeah. But are you still in Northern Sweden or you moved? No, when I moved back to Stockholm, I mean, we were going to to start up our agency in London or New York because that's where we did our internship. So we felt it was way cooler. But then all our friends moved back to Sweden and Stockholm specifically. So the people I studied with in Sweden, they all moved to Stockholm and the people I studied with in Stockholm, many of them moved to Stockholm, so in, in the UK. So we then decided to let's start our agency in Stockholm and that's how it went. And the agency is still in Stockholm, but I live like one hour outside. Okay. And I have two kind of questions here. And I think in this particular instance, I'm gonna uh, link them together because obviously the name of the podcast is God Talks and... (laughs) Mm -hmm. I always ask this question, like, what's your relationship or what's your approach with your gut feeling? But I'd like to link into this risk as well, Mm -hmm. because based on what you're telling me, you've always been just taking risks left, right and center. And are these risks you take also linked or driven by your gut? 
No, I mean, I think actually after many, many hours of therapy and self-improvement courses and spending money, time and effort on those things last five years, I think that I didn't follow my gut feeling very much when I was growing up. I think I kind of killed it for myself in order to fit in, trying to fit into a macho norm, trying to not be a sensitive person, not being like emotional, not being like all those things. I I think I kind of like strangled those kind of hard when I grew up in order to fit in. And so I've been fighting a lot to find my way back to my gut feeling. And I feel now that I'm much more in contact with my gut feeling than when I was when growing up. So in that sense, but I always been risk to worse growing up. I think that was more connected to in order to show yourself or be out there trying harder. A risk is something you need to consider. So I think growing up, I mean, I wasn't the most risk averse person, but I definitely feel like risk is to me, not something negative per se. Like if you take skiing the way i see skiing is that you need to take risks in order to learn faster in skiing for example or if you don't ask for things you will mostly not receive things either in society unfortunately i don't think it's the right way to do things but i think unfortunately that's how our society is so if someone gives you the finger you should take the whole hand today maybe it's more connected my gut feeling with the risk part but I'm, I don't think it necessarily changed much. I still think it's worth it to take risks if I think that it feels good in the gut, you know. I like how it puts it together, yeah. No, I relate to some of the stuff you're saying because it took me time to take risks or voice my opinion because everything would be just in my head. Yeah. But then I wouldn't make the step at all. Yeah. And even in class, if I wanted to ask a question or say something, I wouldn't. Even though I wanted to, I would just feel that I had heartbeats and like I would like start stressing out and sweat and whatever. And after years, you realize like, why, why was I like that as a kid? Yeah. How did um, you manage to change? I think it was all in my head. I, I can't remember the exact instance, but I was already in my twenties, actually. It started maybe slowly, but I think for me, it was moving out, moving away and realizing that I can just be me because mm. there's no judgment. There's no one around that I know. I don't care. And then when I started seeing that, ah, doing something gets to this or to that, it opens up a world of opportunities. I was like, oh, yeah, I need to do more of this. But that took time as well. And exactly as you said, for me, I say it as say yes, basically. And you say, you get the finger, you take the hand, right? And that was it for me. Yeah, it does really resonates with me as well. Yeah, and I, and I still yeah. uh, try to do it now. And risk is the most, I guess, important thing because... Uh, the question to ask is what's the worst thing that can happen, right? Mm. Even though now it can seem so easy to do or to say, to some, it can be very difficult. Even people of all ages, at least kids, they take risk, right? When they start walking and stuff because they're not scared. Yeah. And I think risk is different for everyone. And you can't say that one person is less riskful because the other person take what someone called bigger risks. I think that for everyone have their own challenges, but I think for everyone, it's just important that to understand that often challenging your risks is also a way of learning. Stepping out of your comfort zone is how you grow your comfort zone. And that is always going to see be seen as a risk. Yeah, so true. I totally agree. It's uh, different to different people because the experiences and lives are so different. I don't like to talk about this, but I think for me, when COVID hit, for example, it was not a big deal. And I guess you will relate to that just because I guess of your experience. But for me, based on where I come from, I had war some at some point in my life or no stability explosions, whatever. So for me, it's like not a big deal. Whereas mm. to others, that was huge. Like we need to be locked up and masked and whatever. And it's like, and? Mm. So it's so relative, I guess, to each person. Um, yeah, for sure. No, exactly. And I mean, you had that experience and other people have like, oh, I grew up with an alcoholic parent. Mm -hmm. So I see things that other people don't see, for example, or I think everything that we grow up with will give us a set of benefits and also negative effects. And that's just who we are. Yeah. How does this affect your work, actually? 
I'm not going to say maybe what you deliver, let's say, but the way you work, the way you approach relationships and projects in general. I think where I know that our clients very much appreciate us being honest and trying to be as, as human as possible. I think most good agencies are very good with relationships. That's half of the work, of course, but there are some that are colder or trying to act professional or acting grown up, et cetera, or trying to be too serious about things. We don't like that. We don't want to use buzzwords too much or bullshit about that a color means too many things because we see, for example, color as just being something very subjective and very situation based. So the color red, yeah, it can be a warning color by nature. But on the other hand, people drink Coca-Cola, which is red, and they walk into an airplane, right? Virgin or Norwegian, that is red, or they jump into a red car. It doesn't matter that it's a warning color by nature when it comes to branding, for example, or green can be grass, green can be marijuana, green can be envy. So, I mean, everything is just situation-based and very subjective. So I think that for us, how we try and use this in our work is one thing with the relationship with our clients. And there, I think it's more appreciated. Sometimes we're honest with clients and we don't win the pitch and they think we're idiots. But in that sense, we also feel that but we it wasn't a good match then. We wouldn't have probably been a good match anyway then because we are too far away on how we see things. On the other hand, we are very risk averse when it comes to voicing our opinions of how things are in our business. Recently we did, we wrote an article about the AGI organization worldwide for graphic designers, which is mostly men and you can only be recommended by the existing members. And since most members are already white men, only of course, mostly white men will be elected all time and time again. So out of 667 members, I think. 11% 11% are women and almost no one is not white or et cetera. And I think that for us, we talked a little bit about this, me and my partner, like not, not if we were going to publish because we were like, let's definitely write this article because we think it's wrong. We discussed a little bit afterwards. Why is it that we dare to do this? Why do we feel like the risk is not that big for us? And one thing that we talked about is that we don't compete with our work. We don't send our work to get awarded. Maybe that's a thing that, that other agencies, they do they use awards a lot to win awards with their work. And in those juries are a lot of old white men. Uh, and they are most probably, most of, a lot of them are members of, for example, AGI or similar networks. Then the, it is an actual financial risk for your agency to voice your opinions because those people might not vote for your project then or whatever. And in the one way for us, it's very liberating them that we don't uh, compete with our work because yeah, then we can say whatever we feel like and that we don't have to fear. That's an interesting approach actually. So going back to what you're saying now and what you mentioned at the beginning on how you got started and your appetite for risk and your statements like making enemies, gaining fans, what do you look for? in designers or collaborators, because you work with freelancers and you're a small team, right? What do you look for to when it comes to hiring or collaborating? First of all, we work a lot with world-class designers and copywriters. A lot of people say that, but since we are very consultant based and we've been around for 17 years, we work with a lot of people and we trust a lot of the people we work with, of course, with their level of quality, but that also means that we First of all, the person has to have the level and the style that we want. And a lot of people are, are, can be great, but they might not fit those, like the style, for example. But secondly, very importantly, it's the personality because we've had a lot of people coming and going that have been amazing at their work, but they are not well behaved or they are not nice people. And we can't work with that. It doesn't work for us at all. Everyone has to have respect for each other and treat each other like nice people, et cetera. So for us, those two are like the biggest things. And you always look for collaborators, right? Yeah. I mean, we changed constantly. So Mm -hmm. some people we worked with for 15 years now, and some people we worked with for one year. So it's very different. And people are booked up on different projects, of course, all the time. So things Mm -hmm. change and people. So you mentioned actually quite a few times through uh, our conversation 
the latest one being old white men for the AGI, right? And then you also said how you look different in the army in northern Sweden, like maybe not that much in Stockholm, but in general. And based on your background, have you ever considered taking SNASK to South Korea or somewhere in the area? That's an interesting question. First of all, I want to say that with white old men, we refer to a group of people that are very privileged and yeah. opposed to everyone else. And mm. the old white conservative men that we are mm. opposed to, of course, not an age or a skin color or a gender, but yeah, we it's thought a lot that about you highlighted that just to make yeah, sure I just it's, wanted it's clear. To know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's this good group to see, yeah. gets very offended. So it's good to be very clear that it doesn't yeah. have to do with your gender, skin or whatever age. Mm -hmm. But if you're a conservative, it doesn't matter actually what kind of person, what you are, but often this is the group that is on the top. But when it comes to South Korea, yeah, we would very much love to work with South Korea. We would very much go there and do lectures. I've been there, but for me, the problematic part is that it's a very interesting and very technologically, would you say, innovative country. Yeah, definitely. But at the same time, it's a huge dualism because the culture is very conservative. So the equality between genders is very bad. Everything is just very, very conservative. And according to us, we would love to go there. We would be needed because they would hear a different view, but it can also be, of course, off-putting for them if they don't understand the message correctly, or they feel like, yeah, but we can never do this ourselves, etc. I would love to go to South Korea and I know my partner would as well to speak, but it is hard because of that. Where are most of your clients actually? And what kind of companies? We have maybe 50% Swedish clients and 50% international. And for the international, it's US, it's all of Europe. It's like from all, basically all over the world. We haven't had someone from South Africa or actually a non-African country. And maybe not South American, Central America either. Not that I can recall, maybe some a quotation or something, but almost the rest of the world is basically, yeah, have been our clients. I don't know if this question is relevant or defined, but when you say enemies, mm -hmm. I understood it's about values, but do you get asked, like, what, what do you mean? Would we be your enemy? Is it something that is on the discussion agenda usually? Yeah. People ask us if we have enemies and of course we do. And. Also, we know that people dislike us, but as long as they dislike us on their own, on the right, right terms for us, it's fine. If they dislike us because something is not true, then it feels worse. But if they dislike us because they have other values or see things differently, that's totally fine by us. Maybe it's good that they have us as enemies because I think they also need to voice their opinions and beliefs and we can't everyone think the same. We just need to talk and communicate, of course. I guess some assumed they were your enemies, like Spotify, going back to the story, right? They assumed they are your enemies and three years later they contacted you again. And that was just an assumption because they were not persistent enough, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Or I think the, the people who contacted us, the people we worked with, I don't think they regard themselves as our enemies. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. I don't think Spotify I kind of know that much about us that they would see themselves as that. But I mean, there are a lot of companies out there that we would probably see as, not as enemies, but we wouldn't agree with maybe mm -hmm. how they do things. But then again, there, there's a lot of things that we don't agree with. So I mean, that's totally fine. So you mentioned therapy at some mm -hmm. point, and this is kind of a growing topic. And the fact that you speak about it is also... Mm -hmm. Uh, like you openly talk about it. Why was it important for you? And you said it's been five years, right? Mm -hmm. Five years ago, it was not a big topic, but right now it is. So how did that help you? And how did you feel that you needed it? Well, um, I mean, I, I just want to yeah, put it out there because it could, you know, trigger somebody who might realize that it's something they need. Yeah, for sure. Me and my ex-girlfriend, we split up. I thought about her, either she's psycho because she gets very angry with me or something is not hundred percent with me. Well, of course I knew that she wasn't psycho. So I felt like, hmm, I need to investigate this. What is it? And then I started Googling uh, and I found this couple therapist 
and he mentioned that he had loads, of course, hundreds of couples. And he said that most of the time, the women don't leave men because they don't love them, but they leave men because they don't feel loved. And when I read that, it really struck a chord in me that, oh, oh my God, this is me. Yeah, I'm not making the people around me feeling loved. Why am I not doing this? That relationship didn't, of course, work out, but I felt that started something in me. And then I think when I started my next relationship, I felt that, okay, I was more open to it. And my current girlfriend and fiance, she was like, okay, I think you need to open your door to your emotional life because I will open it for you otherwise, but you should also open it because it's very much needed. And then I actually felt like, okay, this is something I want to do. And after a while I felt like, hey, my girlfriend can't be my therapist. That's the wrong way of doing things. I want to find someone who's, what do you say, not her and someone who's just mine that doesn't have to do with me more than being my therapist. And also I want professional help. I want tools because I can't do it on my own, I felt. So therapy was one thing, but it's hard to find someone that you connect with because you can sit through five first sessions and just talk about your life and the therapist can sit and, mm, mm, uh -huh, and then, and then. And then you realize, why am I doing this all the time? Because I'm not getting out of anything out of it. So finding the right therapist is hard. And then also I felt like, okay, I want to go this course of development, which I did for a year. That was like a course of finding yourself. So you went through a lot of different things, meditation and group sessions. So you were in a class with a lot of people and you did therapy at the same time, et cetera. So that helped me a lot finding my back to myself, basically and structuring things in my head and my emotional life. And then I also did a course called Nonviolent Communication, which is basically a way of communicating that doesn't lead to violence, not physical violence, but verbal violence. Actually, how to communicate and listen to other people in a way that doesn't lead to conflict, but actually leads to something good. And that is all tied back to our own needs seeing the needs behind someone's words and seeing your own needs and expressing them. That was a long answer to your question. So. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's a good end. You felt it helped you, right? Yeah, 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 a lot. I mean, it helped me and you're never finished. So you always keep, have to keep evolving and keep working on yourself. But yeah, I feel like it definitely helped me a lot finding my way to my gut feeling. Okay, <laughs> going back into that. All right. so. Um, thank you for this. I think I would like to talk about maybe design. The first question is, what, what do you do now in the agency? Are you still designing or you're more managing? I think I haven't really been sitting down and designing for the last 14 years or something. Okay. Because uh, there was a point when we started the agency, it felt like, well, we don't have time to sit and design anymore. We have to handle clients and lead the company and all these things. Mm -hmm. And why not just hire better designers than ourselves? That must be the best mm -hmm. thing. So no, I don't sit and actually design. So my role now is except for having a company with my partner, which is a lot of work, of course, it's brand director and also of course, overseeing the design as well. Mm -hmm. But we work with a lot of like really, really great designers. So, of course, we discuss everything and the same with the strategy part between each other. So I think it's highly, very much a teamwork all the time. But then, of course, Slask have a style and a way of doing things, just, of course, our responsibility and something that we do. You mentioned before all the values and how you, going back to your mantra, right? <laughs> Make enemies and gain fans and all this is based on the values and what you want and what you believe. The question here is, how do you educate your clients? We try and do that from the very beginning, from the very first presentation we have before we start working. We try to educate them in realizing what they are buying from us and which parts they actually need and which parts they don't need. And in order to do that, we need to educate them in how we think and how we do things. And then during the process, it's constantly educating them because it's not their line of work. And it would be very strange if it was, because that's why they come to us. We are the experts and they come to us and they pay us for being experts. And of course, then we need to make them understand what it is and what they're supposed to do. And a lot of the times clients 
will go wrong. I mean, they will, it's indefinite that they will go wrong or they will feedback on something in the wrong way or et cetera, but it, that's totally fine. And then we just take a call and we explain to them how things work or why we're taking different decisions. And it's our work to actually make sure that they understand. So it's actually we who also fail. If they uh, misunderstand something, we could probably have done better to make them understand. So uh, yeah, I think that's how we have Do you have a story on this? I probably have millions of stories. I think the color thing is one thing. Like uh, if they ask us like, yeah, I, I asked my wife for my husband last night about this logo and the color. And we were like, okay. Yeah, and he and she thinks that it looks like green elephant. Like, oh, okay, cool. So your wife or husband is a brand expert? Uh, no. No? Because if he or she is, that person should be here instead of you, right? Oh, no, 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 he or she isn't. Oh, okay, so that means we could have just taken in the first person walking past the window from the street and asked that person what they think about this. Yeah, probably. And then it's like, but why does this matter? And then even if everyone thinks it looks like a green elephant, is that a good or a bad thing? Because the way he, the human brain works and the way we survive as a species is to see patterns. Can, if we look at the bushes, can we see a face that looks like a tiger? But that means that we need to run or is it a teddy bear or whatever? I don't know, something else. And that way, everything we see, our brain will try and make it into something. That's why the clouds always look like something. And it's the same with a logo or a color or etc. The brain will automatically try and, oh, this looks like, ba -bam, this. So just coming back to us saying, oh, this looks like a green elephant. Okay, cool. That's fine. That's nothing bad. Or uh, as long as it doesn't look like your competitors or whatever. But then, of course, if you don't want it at all to look like a green elephant, of course, we can change it. But then we need to talk about it differently. Uh, we can't just use a rational argument that isn't rational. Or someone can come back and we made a logotype for a brand that starts with an age. And then they come back and, hey, this looks like a History Channel's logo. No, we can be, yes, it does, because it's also based on the same letter. Uh, and it's a capital letter and they look very similar. Okay. And they're like, but that's not good. Uh, but when is it not good? Is it, do you think your clients are going to go to London, walk into history channels and, and look for your company? No. Okay. Well then I think it's not a problem because it doesn't actually look like the history channels logo, like it's not a copy of it, but it is the same letter. And then you can discuss it in, in these ways, but you need to ask them questions and also like explain why and why it's not a risk or why it's not bad. And, and how the human brain works, et cetera, et cetera. Do you deal with lots of like IP in your work and like in general? We do sometimes, but most of the times the client will copyright their logo they or whatever. Don't. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, I would say today that if someone wants to copy you, they will copy you anyway. If you look at China, they don't care about copyright laws. They, they copy mm -hmm. things anyway. And so. If you were a credible brand, no one will be, if you build a brand, no one will be able to copy you. It will be very hard. If someone wants to start Snask and try and come across as us, I think it will be very hard for them. And they will uh, always be seen as a bleak copy because they are not the real thing. And I think that's what companies should think about. Like Patagonia, no one can copy them. No, no one can start Patagonia in the US and say like, this is Patagonia, the other, but it's no, it's not going to work. Uh, but someone will always copy them in different parts of the world and sell cheap, whatever copies of what they, I mean, and that's very hard to do with copyright. You can't stop that almost. And so trademarks, it's very important to trademark maybe your name, but actually trademarking logos, mm, yeah. But it's also very hard to, for someone to copy. I mean, the Nike swoosh, if you and me started a shoe company tomorrow and we copied the swoosh, we would be idiots. Everyone would just be, what are you doing guys? And it would be very hard for us to make money of that brand. Yeah. I just wanted your um, opinion on that because some people believe you should start doing that at the very beginning and some say, no, you shouldn't. But again, if we take a pen, right, you just change one minor detail that you don't even notice and something else. What everyone copies is product and service. If you have a yeah. good product or service, everyone will copy it. 
And that's like for certain, especially if you're successful, people will copy your product or service and find cheaper ways to do it, et cetera. So what you need to invest in is a brand, a brand that people care about, a brand that people want to follow. And if people like your brand and identify with it, they will actually think your product is better than the other people, even though it might not be, even by, though your product might not taste better than the others, you, the consumer who likes your brand might think it tastes better. Or maybe people who buy a BMW will think it's better than an Audi, even though it's not. So branding is so important to investing instead of like product or service. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And which takes us maybe to uh, two things here. I don't like to mix questions, but in this case, I have to uh, mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> so um, your approach when it comes to branding, your approach and your process, but also you have this, I mean, for me, SNAST is fun, is refreshing. How do you manage to achieve this? in your projects because this is the vibe I get, right? And obviously it's not for everybody. I don't think it's a style. It's more that we strongly believe that a brand can be charming no matter what you do as a business. We think that like a financial institute or a bank, it would be much better if it was charming than very stale, professionally boring. And we, since we work a lot with banks and financial institutions, we get a lot of like that. We need to be, we need to build trust. Trust is very important. And then we ask them, is trust built on wearing a suit, never saying anything grammatically wrong, being very professional in your language, pretty stiff. And they're like, yeah, that's probably trust. And we're like, no, the five people you trust the most in the whole world is probably your parents, your sister or brother, your partner, your best friend, etc." And you trust them, not because they walk around in a suit and never says anything wrong. You tr probably the opposite. You trust them because they do mistakes. They're human. They're vulnerable. You know, loads of shit they did. They will call out your bullshit. But when they say they love you, you know that they really mean it. And that's why you trust them. So trust is not built on stale, stiff professionalism. It's actually built on vulnerability. It's built on actually trust and being honest. And, and genuine and charming, that's how you build trust. And every like other profession, that's how people build trust in a clothing store or whatever. They build trust by being charming, by being genuine. So if a bank comes and when we, we need a branding, we need people to like us. Yeah. The right way is to be more honest, genuine, charming, etc., And then it will maybe feel more fun than the other banks. And we think that if every bank is a person and you line them up in a bar, if we get to brand a bank, we won't, we would like our person to be the most charming because we think that person would win in that bar. And then if someone wants to brand a person in that bar as being very stiff in a suit, that's fine. There's probably a position for that as well. But Snask would probably always go for trying to make their client be more charming, genuine, fun, etc. I like the way you put it together because when you spoke about this trust parameter, I would call it here, and you say that your mother, brother, sister, friend, whatever, will call out on your mistakes. When I ask people to prototype test a product survey, I always say, do not go to your mother, to your friend. It goes back to your logo story, right? The guy mm. asks, asking the wife, right? And in this case, it's like, do not ask the wife, the mother, the brother. No. Go out and get your customers or potential customers. So I do like the way you put it because, again, putting one out of context would not make sense. But in this no. context, it makes absolute sense, actually. Yeah. And I guess people can relate to what you're saying here. So as you were talking, AI today makes mistakes, but we kind of love it also, right? I'm talking about generative AI in that mm -hmm. sense. Did generative AI disrupt, improve, change, I don't know, your processes and your workflow? It, of course, improves more than change, I think. But I mean, that's mm -hmm. maybe the same thing also. But using ChatGPT, of course, speeds things up in using maybe mid-journey in some ways for some people in different lines of work can change things and speed things up or Photoshop. But I think that no matter what you do, you need to use, just simply see it as a tool. And a tool does one thing that is cool or whatever and, and speeds things up, but you have to be there. You have to have ownership and responsibility of what you create in that tool. So 
I read so many emails and, and websites and I can instantly call out that they just asked ChatGPT, copied it and pasted mm -hmm. it and sent it yeah. or wrote it on their website. You need to rewrite it in your own words or you need to filter it. It needs to come from you anyway. ChatGPT is a tool and it can help you. You can brainstorm with it. You can do so all sorts of things, but you can't just use it as a lazy tool because it will backfire. And I think that comes for most of the work, maybe not in bookkeeping, but in bookkeeping, AI will do that 100% in a few years anyway. So can you tell us what was your typical, let's say, approach and workflow before the generative AI tools and after? It hasn't changed much. That's why I almost said that it didn't change much because we still write a lot of things outside of AI. I mean, what, what we visuals are you using? I mean, even or... less for the visuals actually, because oh, okay. uh, the AI in imagery is not good enough yet. And probably in a few years, it will be very, very handy to use it as references. But sketching a scene is way easier to do it still uh, by hand or, or or in computer from your own brain, because that's how you see it. And this is my mission. I want it to look like this. Doing that with AI is harder, at least for us, but we're not experts of AI either. So for us, it's still easier to just draw it in a storyboard, etc. But when it comes to text, for example, we use it more as a brainstorm tool to be like, but then uh, we quickly go off it because it doesn't help. After a while, it just gets very repetitive. So for us, it's also, it didn't change too much. It improved some of the things, but it still needs to come from you. So that's why it didn't change much. Is it a space you are interested in and intrigued in general as a company? Uh, I'm asking this question because I teach in a design school, different, if you want, masters. And then the question is usually like, I, I realize that obviously it's new, right? So you're not going to expect students to be completely exposed to it. Some are interested, some like don't want it at all. And I just want to see what's your your take on this because for sure that it came at a time where many fear for their jobs and some say no this is allowing me to speed up processes to be more efficient to scale faster like all of that so how do you see and i know it's tough to predict obviously we already do work with it somehow yeah. and we definitely know we don't even believe we know that we are going to work more with it of so, course because the the speed that it's evolving it will very pretty soon be good enough for us to use in more processes, but we don't think that it will replace humans. We only think that it will speed up processes more, but of course, I mean, we see dangers for young designers that would start as junior designers. If the system of an agency looks like it does today, AI would be able to take their jobs, but. That is the problem and challenge of the agency. The agency then need to use a unit designer in smarter ways. So I think that we will all just be able to do more efficient and faster work rather than it taking our jobs. Unless you're an agency who just want to automate everything and make the most money in the shortest term possible, but then you don't need humans at all and you need stupid customers basically. But if you're a normal agency, I think that you will still like value creativity. You will value a young designer and maybe he or she shouldn't sit and do mundane administrative design work, but actually mm. maybe do a lot of work and use AI in that way. So how do you stay on top of things? Because as you said, things change and I'm asking you as well from my perspective, I try to read as much as I can, but. It's tough to keep up with everything that's happening and to try everything also. So how? It's, no, but it's super hard. And the older I get, the more fun I think it is to drink wine, reading about new things. <laughs> uh, but of course we do read also about things and we look things up, etc. But I mean, if we would take what's the most uh, out there agency when it comes to AI, Snask is not on the top list there. And I don't think we never were. People told us like, oh, your images that you create, I could do that in 3D. Like, okay, cool for you. Because for us, it's not also about doing it in the fastest way. 
for us, it's a way that we think is fulfilling and engaging to work with our hands. And as an art director, instead of looking at a screen, changing things, rendering, changing things, rendering, we more like to stand with physical objects, pushing something in a certain direction, looking in the camera as well, taking a new photo. For us, that's what's giving. And it's not about being effective. A Swedish monk actually said, he was a monk in Tibet or in Thailand for a long time. And they had an assignment to bring a Buddha statue up on a mountain. And he'd been a business consultant. So he quickly calculated the fastest way to do this rather than spending three days. And he told his master, this is how we do it in a matter of a couple of hours. And he said, thank you. And I said, but this is not the reason why we're doing this. We're not doing this to be the most effective. We're doing this for the teamwork and for us to have this thing together. And I think that's created, it's not as insightful, this last way of doing things, but it's more like passion for us. It's more passion. The reason why we do things is not just to sit in front of, of our screen all the time, but actually also being allowed to work with our hands. And there's a handicraft in that. And I do think that AI will also push human verified things. So the more AI is developed, the more also the demand for, but is this made by a human or an AI? It will start to develop as well side by side, because it's not interesting in a piece of art. It's more interesting if the person who did it maybe felt less good at the time or had a struggle or a challenge or something. So in that sense, it's like a poem or whatever, but you won't relate that to an AI, not today at least. And so art, poetry, so a lot of those things, even if, yeah, but an AI can do that. Yeah. But that for me, that doesn't matter. I want to know the source and I want to know the story behind it. And it's the same with songs, et cetera. And I think that will also grow the human verified aspect. Yeah. I see what you mean here. It's just taking me back. AI, just going into a debate that might be nonsense, but let's give it a shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like AI is taking, I will call it collective intelligence, right? From you, me, everybody else that can add, let's say, information or data in a pool and then do something about it. And this is where you would be like, isn't it not amplifying maybe specific patterns, right? And coming up with something. The question is, I'm just going back to what I've written here, which I copied from your website. We are SNAS and we are your future romance. So you're saying AI cannot be romantic in an authentic way it probably will be at some point but being romantic is not only about the sender it's also about the receiver because a person who thinks that it's romantic to give a red rose on valentine's day the receiver might have higher expectations and feel that that's lazy you never even buy me flowers any day and you only go past the subway on your way home and there's a line of men buying a red flower and you do it as well. And maybe that's not enough for me. That's not the right way. It would have been better if you just the day before just gave me a hug and told me why you love me. And that would be more romantic. So then the romance is not about only the sender, but also the receiver of things. And so it's hard. It's even if the AI is romantic, it's about also the receiver of things. But then I think it's also worth mentioning that what you say that AI is a collective part of all of us, but that also means racism, misogyny, a lot of things. Like if you ask an AI, can you find me a photo of a makeup of an image of a creative director, it would be a white man with glasses, for example. It would never be a woman. It would never be a person of color, et cetera, et cetera. And that way also AI is made by the tech world. And 72% of the tech world are men. And out of those 72%, 60% are white and 30% are Asian. So it's Asian and white men who are in the tech world, basically. And they are the ones developing the AI. So that's one thing of AI. The second is AI takes from a pool of all the information online, which is also not very uh, good all the, way, all the time. And thirdly, the person who puts in the prompts need to shake it and need to be like, is this diversity, is this inclusion? And if the person doesn't do it, you will very easily become wrong in that sense as well. Yeah, that's a very uh, good point actually you're making here. And it's true, it's in the tech world, even though 
some people have backgrounds also in linguistics. It's not just enough. You're still in the tech world. And this is why maybe as more people everywhere, like globally start using it, then I think we'll see. I'm not a techie to understand how it works, but your point is valid and we need more information to get more perspectives, possibilities, and points of view that maybe a human being cannot think of. And then it can get more interesting, I guess. Yeah, for sure. If you ask AI to draw a woman, it will be more similar to if you ask a hundred men who are an illustrator to draw a woman, it will be more accurate to their, how they draw a woman than if you ask a hundred women to draw a woman. AI will most of the time look like the men ways of drawing a woman. And that's also a thing that is like, it's not right. And we can't leave AI in the hands of itself or take the world. Everyone needs to be involved, as you say. So going back to the romance part, you have, we are mm -hmm. Snask and we are your future romance. Can you just expand on this? <laughs> I really like that because we want to reach out our hand and a hug to anyone. And we want to, what do you say, feel open. We want to be open to, to people who go to our website and feel like, oh, okay, this could be my future romance. Uh, and we like that. Going back to the beginning, when we uh, just started recording this episode, is there a greater risk you took besides starting your agency with zero experience? No, I don't think so, actually. I think that was probably the biggest risk that I ever made. Because it's not a big risk to tell someone you love them. It's a made-up risk in your head. But it's not a big risk if you compare it. But actually, maybe starting... And maybe starting your own agency with zero experience isn't a big risk either. It's just a perceived risk. But of course, the people around you will see more negatively on you starting your own business with zero experience than you telling yeah. your partner that you love them. It's not seen as risky or negative, you know. And what has changed from when you started till today when it comes to what clients want and what they look for? For Snask, I think in the beginning, it was much more design work just pure design work. And then we kind of made the strategy ourselves without getting paid for it. I think nowadays clients much more ask for also the brand strategy part. They well, wanted they to make some asking for that. Okay. Yeah. Also some clients don't know that they ask for it, but they want it to make sense. They don't just want you to create something that is beautiful. They want it to make sense. And in order to make mm -hmm. something that makes sense, you need the strategy part, the thinking behind it. And in terms of knowing what, if you're working with B2B, let's say, or, you know, B2B2C or so on, what is it that they look for today that was never on the table maybe 17 years ago? Because now we, you, you speak also about ethical branding, responsible branding, and, and there's also lots of noise around this ESGs, SDGs. I mean, for me, they're just buzzwords, but... It's about what you really do, right? Not just what you label yourself with. Mm. So, and the different generations, right? What they look for. And when it comes to fashion, it's just different than what used to happen before. So how are you dealing with those evolving demands or requests? For us, I think that when we started up 17 years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, for example, there was a bigger difference between B2B brands and B2C brands. Today... B2B brands come to us and ask, do you have experience of B2B? And for 20 years ago, it was a big, bigger difference. But today it's more age to age, it's more human to human. Because a person in a suit at, at his or her work won't be disgusted by an Airbnb B2C ad because they sit at work. And then when they come home and change and they, oh, now I like this ad. Because it's the same person, the same human being. He or she might even book their private trip when they're at work. They won't see Airbnb as unprofessional because it's B2C. They trust it, they rely on it. And so B2B brands have started to become much more human to human. They started to realize, okay, so there's a human sending a message that is going to be received by another person, human. And that way, 17 years ago, I think compared to now, maybe clients come more and ask for something that means more. That, mm -hmm. that it matters more, et cetera, which is basically creating a more genuine, charming brand that people like, even though it's business to business. And I think that could be one thing that changed more. Also, I think that 
the people today, rather than say 17 years ago, are maybe more experienced because we maybe talk more about it, but they're more experienced and aware about the branding. While it's maybe 17 years ago, at least in Sweden, people thought, I need a logo for my company. But now they more, it's more like, I need people to like my company. I need people to like my brand. Why and how can I make this happen? Because in this 17 year period as well, it was e-com okay. mm -hmm. and e-com was based on data and data says nothing about the future. Data is only what already happened, which is kind of like uninteresting to us. And with data, conversion came where, where it's like, oh, we need this ad to convert. We do performance marketing where you put in money in an ad that is supposed to convert people to buy a click something, and then they, they, they base their sales on that. But to us, it shouldn't be called marketing, performance marketing. To us, it's like opening a shoe shop in a, in a forest and expecting mm -hmm. people to find it and no one is coming. And then you pay a little bit extra and have a shop in the city on the high street and people walk past it and they walk in and buy. That's what performance marketing is. You only show that you are there. But if, if someone doesn't need a sneaker, they won't click your ad anyway. Yeah. It's just like you need to like when a person need a shoe, your brand should be top of mind. And that you achieve with branding, not performance marketing. That whole thing also changed. So customers today can come to us and ask like, oh, we need this. We need the people to like us. And we went, oh, okay. And how do you do this? And well, we need the ads to convert, of course. We're like, well, that's two different things. You can't make people like you by just being there. You need to like actually say something that is interesting and make people remember you as well. Do you think this conversation will ever change mixing branding, marketing, performance marketing and everything? Mm. I mean, I think it's changing now. We see that a lot of brands starting to realize it and understand it much more. And they did try this a long time. And then suddenly they're like, what's happening? Our conversion rate is going down. What's happening? Our CEO and CFO what needed to be at the same level as yesterday. And our return of ad spend has got worse. It's like, yeah, because you're at the same high street with your same shop. You're just, you're just screaming more, but you need to actually say something. You need to give people a reason why they should even enter your store. Do they even like mm -hmm. the people standing outside or they, you need that? And I think that actually clients are starting to realize. Is it after they spend money on ads that they are realizing? <laughs> uh, probably, <laughs> probably the, okay. they made, a lot of them actually made a business model out of just converting people, just telling people they're there. And when they, and they say, they mix it up and say, we have a strong brand. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're worth this much. Uh, we sell this much per year, et cetera. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with if you are a good brand or not. And if you ask your customers, do they like your brand? Most of the times the answers will be product focused. Yeah, they like our watches. Yeah, why don't they like your watches? Yeah, because it's a good style or it has good, nice colors or blah, blah, blah. It's only product focused. It's not based on a brand. It's not based on a story. It's not based on the personality. So actually they probably don't have a brand at all. It's just based on a product, which means that tomorrow a competitor could do the same thing. Looking at startups only, many of them focus on what we do, how we do it. But even aspiring entrepreneurs, this is what we do. This is how we do it. It's never why. Mm. And when you talk about large organization or with large organization, They look at themselves, competitors, and what they do, but it's also not the why. I mean, the why is, no one knows why. what the why is there anyway, mm. Most, right? Yeah, so, for sure. And this starts in-house, and this goes with like proper onboarding and so, some, like all the way through when people start, but also saying something internally as well, and not just for the entire world. Yeah, so, and I mean, as you say, most companies don't know their why and they will mix up the how with their why and the why will, I mean, of course, if you have a business, money will always be a thing, but that can be, of course, the why of company like Scenic says, uh, you need it to be something. And I think that's a good exercise for a company to understand, do we have a brand or not? It's like, do we have a why? And secondly, does our customers know our why? And if not, probably our brand is, is critical. We need to improve some.
No, that's a fascinating topic. And it's always, I think, recurring as well. I don't, I work more with products, customer experience, but you have to mention the why anyway. And the why yeah. is, is so essential and it's often diluted. Mm. And it makes a, a difference. This is why I was also asking you, branding and marketing, this ever love and hate eternal conversation is like we fail at marketing and then we realize we need branding. Uh, yeah. But obviously we can generalize. It's not all companies, but many of them, I guess the digital natives also got that right. Yeah. Uh, way ahead. <laughs> um, what was the best piece of advice you have received? Wow. The best piece of advice? I'm not sure, actually. We got a lot of good advice during the years. Actually, um, a friend of ours came by and he looked at uh, what we do. And he also had an agency. And he said, you're invoicing for a visual identity. We we're like, yeah. But to me, it seems like you also do the brand strategy. And we're like, yeah, but we have to have a reason why we do the visual identity. And he's like, yeah, but I invoice more for the strategy than a visual identity. And you guys don't even invoice for it. And we were like, what? And like, this is a boring, boring advice. But for us, it was like a big thing because we were like, oh, okay. So it's actually, there's a way to invoice for that service. And then we learned that, oh, that's what a brand agency does. And we only saw ourselves as a design agency. And that was maybe our second year in the business. And we were like, oh, okay, we can actually to make this into a delivery. I mean, some companies just do brand strategy and that's it. So some people it's do it, of course. Definitely a service, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And a piece of advice that you would give to listeners here who don't know that they need a brand strategy or want to start in brand strategy? I think it's the best advice is just to see your brand as a person. And do you want your, your person uh, the people are supposed to fall in love with. Do you want this person to only be product or service based? Or should this person also be charming? Should this person be someone who you can rely on, who actually protects you or who actually stands up for things that he or she thinks is right or wrong, etc. And just compare your company or brand to a person. And 100% uh, out of 100, you will feel like, no, our brand is not interesting enough. You would not date this company or brand if it was a person, would you? And actually try and make it more into a genuine, charming person. And I think that's a good advice if you're looking for brand strategy. Cool. Freddie, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know if there's anything you would like to add or where we can mm. find you. <laughs> you can find me on class.com is most easily. Other than that, thank you for letting me be on the gut show. Uh, following my gut feeling. Thank you so much for listening. If you've derived value from the show, you can subscribe on platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Your feedback is incredibly important to us, so please consider rating the show or leaving a review. It's a fantastic way to help other podcast explorers discover our content. To gain more insights, visit our website at ggutt.com. This is wgutt.com. And see you next time.